I'm going to start th- this evening in John chapter 2, and I'm actually going to share this evening the same thing I shared this afternoon at the apartments. Um, I'm going to pick back up where we left off last week, next week. Um, last week, um, if you remember, we uh, you know, really started talking about being led by the Spirit. And remember last week we were talking about, you know, so often if you, if you say, you know, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, immersed in the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. And there's so many things that come to mind. But as you start looking through the Word, it says, the Spirit of God leads you to put to death the deeds of the flesh. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is love. And I'm not putting any, I'm not discounting at all any gift. But I do know this, as you look through scriptures, you can have the gifts and still go to hell. And I'm not even sure what gifts, but I know this, it says, there are those that prophesied in his name. There are those that, that did all kinds of signs and miracles in his name. And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. And lawlessness is breaking the law of God. Not loving God with all your heart, your neighbors yourself. We, we, we see in 1 Corinthians 13. If you speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but love is not in your heart, it's a clanging symbol. It's just noise. The end result of what the Spirit of God, the evidence, I should say, of the Spirit of God in our heart is the walk of love. He empowers us. He teaches us. It's Him that brings conviction. It's Him that brings power. It's Him that brings change. It's Him that leads us to die. So we were just touching on that. Next week we'll pick up on that and talk about sanctification in the Word of God. How is it lived out? What does it look like? But today, I want to come back to John chapter 2. And what we're going to look at, you know, so often, especially during this time of year, you know, especially with Easter coming up, we, we hear in regard, 99% of the gospel that we hear is how much God loves you. And you know what? It's absolutely true. That's what drove him to the cross. You know, if you read the book of Song of Solomon, it's the Song of Solomon, it's the song of love. And it's the story of, 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 of heart, God's heart toward his bride. And, and one of the things I love is, is chapter 4 of Song of Solomon where he says, he says, my darling, you ravish my heart. And we've said before that word ravish means you have unhearted me. Which basically says, he says to us, you have stolen my heart. Mm -hmm. But just like in Song of Solomon chapter 1, when he speaks of the Shulamite bride, she says, I'm black, I'm dark, I'm unworthy to look upon, don't look at me. And so often that's our heart toward God. Because there's nobody that knows you better than you. (laughs) Listen, we can put up a front and everybody can say, and how many people have said, you're just a good guy. Or a good girl. Or just a wonderful person. You just do nice things. But you walk away and sometimes you know yourself. And you go, God, I just, how can you love me? And that's what the Shulamite said. How? How do you, I don't see myself the way you see me. And think about right now in regard to your life. Not the people next to you. Not the people you care about. Not the one that you think should be hearing this message. Stop for a moment and think about you. And imagine, you don't have to imagine, but imagine the Lord saying to you personally, You have unhearted me. You have stolen my heart. Matter of fact, I hold you in such value. It's like Jesus telling the parable. He said the kingdom of God is like a, a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great price. He sold everything he had in order to obtain it. You have unhearted God. And upon finding you. Upon him looking at your life and saying. It is of high value to me. So much so. I will give all that I have in order to obtain it. Now think about that for your life personally. In all the garbage that you know about you, and he says to you, you have stolen my heart. 
you don't see you the way that I see you. And I have pursued you. I have paid the price. Not in gold and silver, but in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so often we hear about that love. About the love of God toward man. Again, the parable of the man seeking treasure. And upon finding this one treasure, he gave up everything he had in order to buy that field to obtain that treasure. We hear so often of the passionate love of God and how you and I and the church as a whole has unhearted him. He loves us with a love beyond comprehension that he felt, he saw us in such value that he gave the ultimate price. But here's what I want to talk about today. We hear that all the time. And, we, and you know what, let me say this, we need to hear that. And one of the reasons I say that is because so often we're so convinced of our own unworthiness, it's hard to accept and receive the love of God. Am I right? And he has to keep saying through the things we walk through, I love you. And the more convinced we become of that love, two things, the less we have to pretend for others. And two, the more we trust Him. You won't trust somebody if you don't believe they love you. But when you're convinced they love you, you learn to trust them. But here's what we want to talk about today. Has God unhearted you? Has God stolen your heart? Do you and I hold God to a value, we're going to see this in a little bit, to where everything we have cannot compare to obtaining, to holding Him? Because let me tell you what spiritual adultery is. It's finding other things to the same or greater value than God. Idolatry is finding higher value in other things than God. So setting my attention on Him. I mean, on on, on these things. So, we're going to look at this today. Has God unhearted you? Is your heart passionate for Him? And we'll we'll see two examples. The Gospel of John, chapter 2, starting in verse 23. Now, when He was in Jerusalem at the Passover... During the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. So keep in mind, here was the picture. This isn't the last Passover where Christ was about to die. This was a Passover at the beginning of his ministry. And at the Passover, the multitudes were coming into Jerusalem. So it was crowded. They were full of people. And people were beginning to see and hear Jesus, in the power of His words, they were beginning to see that there's an authority to what He's saying. There were signs and wonders that were happening in regard to His, not only His name, but in His, his, his words, there was life going forth. They had heard about the miracles of the, of, the, of the changing of the water to wine. They were hearing about the signs and the miracles. And so they were coming to Christ, the multitude. But then verse 24 it says, But Jesus on His part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now think about that for a moment. The multitudes were coming in. They were pressing in. They were seeing the signs and the wonders. They were drawn to his teaching. But it says he did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in man. Now think about that. Listen, why were they coming after Christ? Why were they looking to him? Because they were seeing what he was doing to people, what well, for people. They were hearing things and their hearts were attracted to that. How much of our gospel centers around what God can do for you? How God can make you happy. 
how He can fix things for you. And so all of a sudden, my attraction begins to be what He can do for me, rather than who He is. And so often, Christ becomes not the one who has unhearted us, who has stolen our heart, but He more or less becomes our BFF. Our best friend forever. You know? Now listen, I'm going to tell you this right now. My wife does not want to be my BFF. She doesn't want to be my best friend. Now, we are best friends. And sometimes she would even define that, you know, he's my best friend. But I'm telling you, if, I, if that's all I am to her, and all she is to me, then there's a lacking of intimacy. <coughs> there's something deeper. See, my children have BFFs. And there are people in your life... Listen, Sean and I have spent hours together on the road. There are things that we talk about, things we do together. I have other people that I spend time together that are very close to me. But nobody in regard to the human relationship meets the same place that my wife meets in my life. It's a different relationship. And in the same way, God's not asking to be your best friend. Yes. Is he a friend that sticks closer than a brother? Yes. But the relationship with him is more intimate than that. And so often we really relate to God as a dear friend, as a good friend. But he doesn't necessarily hold the value as maybe other things do. Because these other things get our time get our effort, get our resources. What happens when your heart has been stolen? <clears throat> Listen, there were a lot of different girls that I knew. But I'm going to tell you this, when I met Rebecca, I can tell you today what she was wearing. Long, sleek black pants and a pearl blouse. She unhearted me. From that point on, I became the stalker. I began to search her out. Listen, there were relationships that I had before Rebecca, and I would struggle with, okay, you know what, I'm just not ready to get married. I just don't make enough money. I just don't know what I'm going to do in life. I'm not ready to cross that line. I just don't know. How do you know whether you really love somebody? I would go through these struggles like this. When I met Rebecca, my job situation didn't change. My money situation didn't change. I, no longer, I didn't have all the wisdom and all the... Bu- I knew I'm ready to cross that line. She has done something to me. I am ready to cross that line. And so often, we really haven't come to a place where we're ready to cross that line. Not to surrender all. Not to give all. We just would prefer a good relationship. Look with me in Philippians chapter 2. Chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that. Now listen, stop for a moment. I I haven't always focused on the more than that. But in looking at the more than that, he begins to talk about before, verse 7, the wonderful qualities of his life that other people admired. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees born a Hebrew. As to the law, as he saw it before Christ, he thought he was perfect. He thought he was a good man. Everybody else thought he was a good man. But then he says, it's not the evil things that I count lost. It's the things that were gained to me. The things that my reputation hinged upon. All of that I count lost. Now here's the question, why? He was overcome with the love of Christ. It wasn't, I've got to count these things lost. I've got to throw these things off. Oh, I can't love this world anymore. I don't want to love this world. I have been enthralled by Christ. It's love that has driven me. I count everything as lost to know Him. But then He says this, More than that, 
more than my reputation, more than the good qualities. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value. I think about that word value. He found something. He found a pearl of great price. He found a treasure hidden in a field. And he said the value of that is greater than anything I've ever experienced before. I give it all up to obtain that treasure. The value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ. Other translation says, so that I might win Christ. So think about that. I count it all loss for this moment. I want to win the heart of Christ. Let me ask you tonight. Do you want to win the heart of Christ? When I look at my relationship with Rebecca... Listen, she had almost gotten married before she met me. And I would like to tell you that when she looked at this handsome person right here, I don't know that she was enthralled as quickly as I was enthralled. You know, I always kid with her. She gets upset with me. But, you know, the DNA was just scratching the bottom until until she... And I hit her at the right moment when she lost her senses and said yes. But I remember... I remember, I am going to win her heart. The pursuit of it. The, I remember buying like four or five dozen roses and one was here and one was there and she'd find them as she goes. I did. It was the brief moment of my life where I had romantic creativity. I lost it after marriage. I don't know why. I do the best I can. I did lose it. I'll regain it. Help me, Lord. But, but to win her heart, her affections. Do we desire to win the affections of God? Well, Andy, you know that just works. I don't have to. Does your heart leap within you? I, will, I count everything but loss. because Not because I have to, but because I have been overtaken by love. I love Him. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And you know this passage, but relating it to what we're talking about tonight. Has God unhearted you Have you been stolen by His love? And a a love to seek Him. 1 Corinthians 9. And starting in verse... um, Verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you might win. Now think about this. As Paul is relating, so he's taking a a, a sports analogy of track and running and relating it to our relationship to Christ. And he says, do you not know that all who run, run to receive a prize? Run in such a way that you might win. Think about this. If you knew only one person here could win the affections of Christ. Is he of same is he of value to you? Would it be worth it to you to step into the ring, and step into step into the arena, to run in the competition, no matter how slow you might think you are, if you knew that only one person could get that prize, would you step into the arena and forget everything else and run with all that you are toward him? everyone who, verse 25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. 
Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. We're going to probably touch on that verse next week. But think about this in relationship to our heart toward Christ. Are we running without aim? Are we running to win? Run that you might win. Listen, he's challenging you. In this Christian life, have you become passive? Oh, I love Jesus. How many of you want to be loved that way? I love my wife. Now, I will tell you, in the natural journey of life, you take advantage of the person close to you most often. I get used to Rebecca being there. And I do forget to pursue her. I do forget to sometimes. And that's why, listen, when we got away on our, on our, our men's retreat with six men, one of the men brought up Proverbs 31. And he says, what do you cherish about your wife? And tears started coming down his eyes. And he said, I can see in my own life that I haven't cherished her. And he told us to go through Proverbs 31 and write down qualities you see in your wife. Just a few of them. And let's talk about them when we come together. You know, listen, you you tend to take advantage of the one you love most usually because you're familiar with them. And you forget to say thank you. You forget to, to, to recognize them for who they are. So all that in, in mind. Has Christ, is he of value to us? To pursue with all of our heart? Or is he just one of the things that I want to pursue? Look with me in the book of Ruth. And I know that we've touched on some of these things in the past with Ruth. I love the book of Ruth. But without going through the whole story, I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis up to where we're at in regard to what we're talking about today. Winning the heart of God. Here is a man in the book of Ruth whose name was Elamech, which means God is my king. And he has a family. And he's living in Bethlehem, Judah, which means the house of bread in the land of praise. And there's a famine, there's a trial that comes into the land. There's a testing of food and bread. There's a lack. And in that place of lack, this man whose name is God as king begins to look toward other avenues to resolve his need. Isn't that what it says in Isaiah, seeing the children of Israel? Why do you keep going back to Egypt in the midst of your test? And he says, listen, Pharaoh's horses are going to be your own shame. His strength is going to be your downfall. Why do you keep looking to other places when you begin to be tested and tried? So here this man whose name was God as king went to take his whole family to live in the land of empty desire, land of Moab. And as they lived there, it says they went to sojourn for a little while. They never intended to stay there. But one year becomes two years, becomes three years, How many of us have stayed longer than we intended to stay in places? I never intended to be in that situation that long. But all of a sudden, here they were in this place called Moab, and it says, Elamech dies with his two sons, sickness and wasting away. We won't spend much time there, but that's a neat story. And so Naomi, her heart, her heart's name being pleasant, begins to hear that God visited his people with bread. God answered those who waited. God was faithful to those who stayed. He did not forget their cry. He did answer. He who is coming will come. And so she began to say, I'm going back. And she had two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth. Orpah means stiff-necked, the mane of a horse, the the, the neck of a horse, strong-necked. Ruth means friend. So their husbands had died. Their mother-in-law said, I'm going back to the place where God is. And it says they both rose up and they both 
went to follow her. Now I'm convinced, and I'm reading in here, the reason they followed her is because even in the place of Moab, the place of empty desire, Naomi had spoken of God. I believe that Naomi had talked about the God of her youth. How many times have you been in, in a place of, 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 of backsliding? And a place of, 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 of tasting sin? How many of us have been in a place where we've drifted because of our own unbelief, our own pride, our own unforgiveness, whatever it is, and we've walked through a season of just dry emptiness, but we found ourselves, even in the midst of it, talking to people about God. And even though we felt distant, we can't get away from the reality that He is. And I believe they heard stories of God's faithfulness. And when Naomi got up and said, I'm going back, her two daughter-in-laws, think about this, both of them said, we're going to leave everything to go with you. They were going to leave their culture. They were going to leave their parents, their siblings, their cousins, their families. Everything that was dear to them, they boasted up to go back with Naomi. And Naomi stops them and says, listen, why will you go with me? Even today, if I was to find a husband and to marry and to conceive this moment, this day, can you wait for me in order for those sons to grow up and marry you? No. And she says, listen, there's nothing for you if you go with me. Every dream, every desire, every need for a husband and desire for children and family, you may never experience She says, go back. And at the point of the cross, when it cost them both something, you could tell no difference between Orpah and Ruth until there was the cross. And here's what happened at the cross. Orpah hugged her mother-in-law. Oh, there was such love for her. And she kissed her mother-in-law, it says. And she turned back To her people and to her gods. Why? Because she could not. God and the God that she had heard of did not have the value to her to endure and to go forward. She looked at what she would lose having a husband, having children. She looked at the things that were dear to her and the cost to give that up in order to have him was not worth it to her. And at that place, Orpah, the stiff-necked one, turned back. But then we find the heart of Ruth. And when the cross was presented to her, I'm going to start, I'm going to read to you what I just told you. Verse 10. And they said, that's Orpah and Ruth, to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi, the mother-in-law, said, Return, my daughters, why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, go forth, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I said I have hope... If I should even have a husband tonight and bear also sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. And that word, clung, where did I write it down? Um... Um, um, picture one who is on her knees clutching around her waist. Ruth clung to her. One walked away and the other clung to her. And she said these words, which we, which we now, and keep in mind as we read these words, never again will you hear of the story of Orpah. Never again will you hear her future, her life, what it was like. But here's what happens in verse 15. 
Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus the Lord, thus shall the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you from me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, steadfastly minded, she said no more to her. Now think about the difference there. Remember John chapter 2? They saw the miracles. They saw the signs. They heard His Word. And they gravitated toward Him. But He did not entrust Himself to them. Why? Because they were coming for all the wrong reasons. They were coming for what they could get from God. Today we serve a very extremely humanistic gospel. What can God do for you? How can God give you a happy life? How can God make you successful? How can God put everything back together for you? How can He get... Listen, you go back to the heart of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even if He does not deliver me from your hands, O King, I will not deny Him. Even if He does not serve my purpose. Even if He doesn't make my life happy. If He doesn't fix the things that I'm crying out to Him for. I will not deny Him. And here you have Ruth saying, even if it cost me. Now keep in mind, we get to read the end of the chapter. We get to see the story. Can you see the crossroads right now in Ruth's life? She has to make a decision. Am I willing to give up the future of family when all I have to do is turn around and go back to my family, to my people, my friends, my culture, the things that... I, let me tell you something. I have the utmost respect for people who are missionaries, or even lost people who come to them. I can't imagine how often it happens here from India and from Africa. People don't even know the language. And they come to America. And they have to learn everything. And they leave everything. Wow. I can't imagine you dropping me in Africa. Or in Mexico. Or in India. Or in Russia. And not knowing anybody. And not knowing the language. And trying to live. She left everything familiar to her. Never knowing what the future held. And she said, I believe. I will not let go. Your God, the one that you spoke of, has unhearted me. I don't know Him. But I want to. I want to know your God. I want to know your people. Let me tell you some of the ones things I I just admire about Rebecca. I can say this when she married me, she left everything. She left it now again, she was fairly new in her walk with the Lord. My friends became her friends. My world became her world. And guys, even so, this girl that grew up much differently than me, I look at some of the places our journey has taken her, in the places she's lived, in a men's home, with 8 to 12 men coming off of addiction in the same home and dirty and the places we've been. She left all that to walk with me. And so... When we're brought to the place of the cross, has God truly... You have unhearted God. There's no doubt about that. The cross demonstrates to every one of us, you have unhearted Him. Let me ask you this. Has He unhearted you? 
as we come into this Easter season and we think about the, the, the love of Christ. He, now think about this. He held you in great value. So much so that He gave all. But as you look at the example of Scripture, there are stepping stones. There are people in Scripture to show, that show us. Paul said, I counted everything to be lost. Not because I walk under a law. You have to die. You have to give up the, the, the external for the temporal. Oh, God. Now think about this. In a relationship, if your husband was looking at you and said, okay, what do I have to... And what, what's it going to cost for you to marry me? You know, I mean, I mean, what do I got to give up for you to... How many of you really want to go that direction? I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell my daughters. If whoever wants to marry you isn't infatuated with you, doesn't love you with all of their heart, move on. Move on. And I'll tell you this. For my sons... If whoever you marry doesn't think you are the best, doesn't look at you with eyes that you have caught my heart, (coughs) move on. Keep going. Don't marry somebody who loves you less than. You know what? When we look at our relationship with God, we will fight to the death for doctrines that tell us we don't have to love Him with all of our heart. We will fight to the death to fight for doctrines that say, I can love Him less than. Why? Why can't, like Paul, we be challenged? Only one receives the promise. Run in such a way that you win it. And everyone who runs in those games practices temperance. Listen, what are the sacrifices of your life to win Christ? (laughs) Listen, the sacrifices you make may be different than the ones I make. You may sacrifice television completely, or you might say, I'm going to resist this or do that. Whatever it is. You run this race that you might win. I'll run this race that I might win. But I can tell you this for me, and I mean this with all my heart, God has unhearted me. I know who I was when He found me. And when the eyes of my heart became enlightened, when He lifted me up out of a pit of destruction, I came after Him with all of my heart. And there have been times when I've strayed this way and strayed. But nothing can fulfill my heart but Him. And everything, even the good things in life, if He's not in it, there's no life in it. If He's not in the middle of it, it has no desire for me at long last. But I'm going to tell you this. Whatever I have, if He's in it, it makes all the difference. Whatever you don't have, if He's in you know I mean? like, it. Totally. <laughs> and, but you know, that's what Paul says. Back to what he says, listen, I've learned to abound into a base. And there are times I can walk into maybe vacationing. We stay in a really nice place. or Whatever the thing is, if He's in it with me, if He's opened that door, and His favor has said, Andy, be at peace and enjoy this. It brings peace to me, even in the midst of temporal things. But I know this, to have all of this and not have Him, I would rather live on the streets with nothing but have Him. So I want to finish up tonight and ask you this. What part do we... And listen, all you can do is walk away and be honest. When we walk away, is He our BFF? Jesus knew that the same ones wanting to get a picture with Him, (coughs) wanting to get a selfie with Him, 
Mm. We're the same ones that were going to holler crucify. Mm. He knew there was nothing mm. of any substance in their heart toward him. Plainly, there's not in any of us. I know Paul said, I give up everything that I might win Christ. I know Ruth said, May nothing but death separate me from you. I'll finish with this passage in John 13. Jesus, or, or the God speaks to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 13. Jesus, God, help me. God speaks to Jeremiah about his people, and he says, My people are like this waistband. And he says, Jeremiah, go get this waistband, a linen waistband. And he says, tie it around your clothes and walk amongst my people. And he walks amongst the people, and then the word of the Lord comes back to him. Jeremiah, take that same waistband now that you've been walking amongst the people and go to the river Euphrates and put it under a rock there and leave it there. So he leaves it there. I don't know how long, but the word of the Lord comes back to him and says, go back to that river and go get the waistband. And he goes get the waistband, this linen waistband that's been sitting in the mud and the moisture and the water, and it's worthless. Yeah. And then the Lord speaks to Jeremiah. And of course, you know what? Jeremiah doesn't know what's going on. He's just <laughs> obeying the word of the Lord. And he says, this waistband is like my people. I created them. <coughs> Cling to me, to cleave to me. Like Ruth clove to, 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 to Naomi saying, I will go with you. But he said they won't. And so like that waistband, they become worthless. <coughs> and the only reason we don't is because other things have attracted our hearts. So as we go through this Easter season, over this weekend, and we consider the love of God for us, I would like you to consider (coughs) our love toward Him. Is He worth the sacrifice? Does He hold value to you that makes it worth worthwhile to you to forgive somebody that has hurt you? Does He have value to you that if to walk with Him means to let go of something in your life, it's worth it. Has he unhearted you? Has he <coughs> stolen your heart? And the last thing I'll finish with when I look back at Paul, again, I don't see Paul saying, Can't y'all see? I've given up. I'm trying my I'm just trying to give it up. I might I'm trying my He was moved by love. Lord, if if this is between me and you, I choose you. Right up front. If anything is a hindrance to me and you, I choose you. Lord, you just show me how to walk that out. And you know what, guys? I'm still... Listen, when I first came to the Lord, I want to tell you this. The best I know, I gave Him all my heart. But guess what? There were still parts of my heart that weren't His. And as I've walked this out, He's brought me to new places and He says, Are you willing to let that go? Oh my. And I might have to wrestle with it a while for a while. I'm going to tell you this. He is a greater value. Andy, you're going to have to trust me and walk this way. <laughs> Do I have all your heart? Yes. It's worth it to me. Is it worth it to you? Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that we're not just left to ourselves to an empty hope. Lord, you've given us examples in Scripture. Matter of fact, Paul even says... Follow me as you see me follow Christ. He says several times, follow the example that you see in those who are following Christ. 
There are people who have been unhearted by God. We can be unhearted by you. We can love you with all of our heart. And Paul challenges the church, run that you might win. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that searches us like a lamp, that searches our inward parts, and where there are those things holding us back, where there are those places that have not been surrendered. Lord, I pray that when we come to those places, Lord, that we will quickly see the value of loving Christ. Not for what we get, but for who you are. Lord, we didn't even finish the story of Ruth that that you by chance brought her into a field of a kinsman redeemer. Lord, when she came through the cross, when nothing else mattered to her but you, you began to put the other pieces of the picture together and she even becomes mentioned in the lineage of Christ, the, the great grandmother of, of 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 or the great grandmother or the the, the son of, of Obed or the child of Obed became the great grandfather of David. Here this Moabite woman who had nothing to offer but love, you took her to places that she never could see. You are so faithful. And the only thing you want is to be first, to be only, to be the object of our affection. Lord, I know as I sit here that many times my affections have been diverted. But I know this, there's no peace, there's no fulfillment in those things. You are the only one that fulfills my heart. And Lord, when we walk away from that, may we consider that. When we walk through this weekend and consider the great love of Christ... May we in return offer you our love and may it be single and not divided. In Jesus' name.